I'm Mark Dawson from The Self-Publishing Show, and this is Self-Publishing Spotlight, where we shine a light on the indie authors who are changing the world of publishing one book at a time. Hello, and welcome to The Self-Publishing Spotlight. We meet indie authors at all stages of their careers and ask them a series of five questions. Five questions about their process, their mistakes, and their successes. Five answers that will help you level up your own author career. My name's Tom Ashford, and I'm part of The Self-Publishing Formula. Don't forget that you can get your self-publishing resource kit at selfpublishingformula.com forward slash starter kit. This week's guest is Sarah Weldon. She's written 15 books in the cosy mystery genre and she lives in the UK. Welcome, Sarah. Hello. I'm fangirling a little bit today uh, because I'm a big fan of the show and a patron. (laughs) Awesome. (laughs) To curb my nerves. (laughs) Uh, Well, would you like to start by uh, elaborating a bit more on the, uh, the 15 books that you've written? Yeah, sure. Uh, so I have 15, uh, kind of counting them, 15 accidental books. They weren't really planned. Um, the first one was uh, an adult colouring book of a Lake District where I used to live. And then I uh, wrote, um, that one's only available kind of on Waterstones and it makes me like a penny. So I don't really count it. <laughs> um, it was self-published. And um, I've also written a romance, a kind of contemporary romance novella under a pen name, which was my first book, uh, first kind of fiction fiction book. And then I wrote um, eight, well, published eight children's stories that I'd written for children I worked with on my children's charity, uh, which I started in Georgia in the country. And uh, I've also got two cozy mysteries, two short stories, and um, I've recently published a one-year sprinting journal and planner for authors, uh, which was very selfish because it's basically just to help me plan my cozy mystery kind of writing and release. Right. <laughs> so, um, but I, put, I published it on Amazon just so that I could have a copy of myself. Yeah. yeah. So, fifteen kind of accidental books. <laughs> wow. That's quite prolific. <laughs> yeah, uh, but it's say not planned at all. But um, I write cozy mystery now, so I've been saving up for a year to get up the covers and things like that. So, um, kind of rapid releasing those now. Nice. Okay, well, if we uh, dive into the questions, number one is why do you write? <laughs> the big question. Yeah. <laughs> and I'll try not to be too uh, long winded with my answer. Um, so I think I'm a bit of a closet writer, a uh, kind of survival writer. Um, I grew up in, in, in care, and so I spent a lot of time kind of moving between foster homes and things. And as part of that, um, I used to go to a Rudolf Steiner school, so creativity was kind of really encouraged. And then with moving kind of foster homes and things, I ended up in it back in state school, and uh, that kind of creativity and stories and um, kind of a like Norse mythology and things that we learned in school uh, that was all quickly kind of bashed out of me right. <laughs> through the education system um, and then I had a, a really good middle school teacher uh, English teacher who gave us some homework to come up with a mystery book um, which I absolutely loved kind of doing I didn't do very well in it in school but uh, <laughs> um, it was kind of the first like kind of permission I had to write a story so that was really nice And then um, didn't really write again until um, upper school and I had another really, really good English teacher who kind of knew I I didn't like the holidays and things and um, to kind of help me through the kind of rough patches suggested that I write um, kind of letters to her and short stories that I could kind of send by letter um, because there wasn't any internet things back then. Um, So I kind of just wrote for survival really. And then I didn't really write at all. kind of after that I was my my kind of English teacher um was encouraging me to do journalism and I did some it was called Trident work experience back back in those days I remember that and yeah (laughs) with the old record of achievement and (laughs) yeah uh (laughs) so I ended up um kind of working uh like doing work experience with the local newspaper and around the same time my old teacher from middle school um her husband uh, was murdered kind of accidentally in a like a drugs raid from one of the kids that was in my foster home. Wow. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, so that was kind of a big kind of um, had a big impact on me, um, and I quickly realised that being in on that court case, I didn't want to be a journalist because it wasn't really reporting kind of the truth. It was a lot of like sensationalism and things like that. So I uh, kind of decided writing. If that was the only option for writing, it wasn't really for me. <laughs> yeah. um, and then I uh, went into kind of medical things, so um, like more neuroscience. And um, yeah, I worked in the NHS then for about 17 years, um, but secretly 
kind of went to, um, I was a fellow of the Royal Geographical Society in London and um, Michael Palin was the president at the time. And so we had lots of like, there were kind of always lots of inspirational people there. Um, so kind of hanging out with them at the, the Explorers Bar, so like Michael Palin, <laughs> uh, Douglas, Douglas Adams, like Stephen Fry. Oh, um, so it was amazing. But um, obviously that was kind of like my secret life. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, cause uh, I didn't think it would be kind of approved of kind of in the like, I don't know, like sciences and kind of things like that. So um, I didn't really write again until uh, I got a job working for um, the Prime Minister in um, the former Soviet Republic of Georgia. So working for the Ministry of Education and Science on uh, educational reform. So um, in the meantime, I'd been working um, mostly kind of in neuroscience, neuropsychology, but working in like kind of effective uh, brain injuries on uh, and stroke and things like that, the kind of impacts of those on the brain and um, a lot of people I work with specialised in kind of the ability to write. So things like dyscalculia, dyslexia, um, and some of the people I work with got those recognised in the education system. So kind wow. of through that, I ended up getting this job in Georgia. <laughs> wow. um, but yeah, that was um, that was really eye opening because it's a country where kids are really creative and they're encouraged to like they'd all read Shakespeare, they'd all read like loads of literature. Uh, libraries were quite a big thing. Um, they were all very musical. They were very proud and very open about being creative. It was kind of really encouraged. So um, I ended up starting this children's charity. And then when I came back to the UK, um, I wrote these eight kind of short children's stories um, based on the River Thames. And I wrote them for those kids, uh, really. Um, and then I kind of published them later on. Um, and then uh, a little bit later on, my landlords in the Lake District um, decided they were selling the house and I suddenly found myself uh, kind of technically homeless, <laughs> basically, uh, because obviously like rent's quite expensive in the UK and uh, I was self-employed as well and I had pets. So um, all the landlords were asking for kind of six months rent up front, wow. uh, two months deposit, uh, kind of, yeah, a lot of money. So um, I ended up uh, moving into a and b for a week on the opposite side of the country where it was much cheaper, which is kind of uh, the area I am now. Um, and uh, I was supposed to be buying a house, <laughs> right. which uh, fell through. So I ended up in the b, &B for about 18 months, at which point um, I kind of realized I couldn't do, I used to do a lot of uh, cruise ship speaking and pay, pay talks in schools. Uh, I worked in the film industry, um, kind of as a medic doing different things as well. And uh, obviously, because I was in the B&B, &B, I couldn't travel. So I needed to quickly find something I could do from home, uh, from kind of my room <laughs> yeah. online. So I started ghostwriting, uh, copywriting, um, and basically kind of saving up to be a full-time writer, which is which was kind of what I really, really wanted to do. So yeah, long-winded answer, but... <laughs> Very interesting, <laughs> <it helps>. <laughs> Very random. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, uh, question number two is, how do you write? So uh, in terms of your, your fiction, do you plot the stories out first or just see where they take you? My first story, so um, like my, my romance story and my eight short children's stories, um, I, I basically just pants those, um, kind of just write them in a day. <laughs> yeah. I'm quite lucky I can write, because of ghostwriting and things, um, I can write like 10,000 words a day wow. uh, if I'm kind of, if I need to. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Um, so, yeah, they were they were kind of pants. And because I wrote Cozy Mystery now, obviously there's a lot more red herrings and uh, kind of suspects and things like that. So um, I only plot now. But um, I'm quite lucky because um, I ran a Kickstarter campaign and some of the like rewards on the Kickstarter were to be characters in my future books um, and to come up with like some of the titles some of the kind of pun titles nice. um, and to name like objects or to give you like a motive or things like that. So uh, my readers are very, very involved in kind of the writing side um, and I get a lot of ideas anyway from just general life. Um, but I uh, then uh, I write in uh, vellum. Um, I absolutely love vellum, so right. I write into that directly, and then I um, copy and paste that into Google Docs, which I kind of check through with Grammarly and things. Um, I live stream my writing on YouTube as well, so um, I'll do like plotting, like if I'm plotting a story, I'll plot it live online, and my readers, uh, Kickstarter backers, patrons, they kind of are online as well, so they get to kind of like make suggestions and things, and like, what if we do this, and what if we do this? Um, 
And then uh, I've got um, an editor as well, who I work on a royalty share basis with because I couldn't afford to pay an editor up front, which was kind of like the more traditional way. Yeah. Um, so as soon as I put it into the Google Docs, I use Grammarly and uh, kind of check through the basic spelling and stuff. Then I put it onto a website called Scrub Scrubberfile, Scriberfile, which is free. And my readers and YouTube viewers then go and kind of critique what I've written that day. Um, my editor also kind of can critique it as well. And then once I'm happy with that, then uh, basically she kind of chases me with the editing each day. So um, I can get books out quite quick. Um, the only kind of thing was like cash flows, so I have to save up for covers. But I mean, in terms of writing, I can, I can do a book a week pretty much. Wow. That is a, that's an interesting process. Yeah, a bit different, but... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I love um I love vellum so yeah um I did try um uh I forgot what it's called now. Scrivener that's the one yeah. <laughs> um yes I did try that but it didn't quite I couldn't quite really I don't know I think I'm just really visual I love to see kind of the big picture and the finished product I love seeing like the cover and the chapters yeah um, and once I've kind of done like a mind map on the live stream then I put it all into the chapters um and then kind of I still pants stuff a little bit like as I go but um yeah, mostly it's kind of plotted out vaguely. So yeah, I I try to use Vellum for the uh, the final draft just because I want to yeah. spend as long as I can in the software. Yeah, <laughs> like you said, it looks it looks so good that it's I don't like. <laughs> yeah, it looks so good. I don't want to just drop it in and go. Yep, yeah. cool. Export done. You know. It's, <laughs> but yeah. Okay. Well, question number three is: Are you a full time author? If you are, how did you get there? And if you aren't, what steps are you taking to make it happen? I am a full-time writer now, but mostly because of being kind of fan-funded, I suppose, <laughs> through yeah. um, Kickstarter and Patreon. Uh, it's taken me a really long time to get here. And I say, because I think because I was in the B&B as well, like I used up all my savings and then to try and find a way to kind of pay for the B&B each week. So it's a bit more kind of survival mode. So, um, and also, and I need to buy things like Vellum up front. So yeah. um, I did some kind of weird things I was very frugal, um, kind of had like no overheads and things. Obviously, kind of didn't have council tax because I was in the B&B. Um, and uh, there was no kitchen there. So I just had like my quaid meal. So <laughs> that was kind of cheap on food. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I basically, um, I, I spent pretty much the first 12 to 18 months just uh, like um, I was on Fiverr and Upwork doing the ghostwriting. And um, I was on Amazon Mechanical Turk originally. Uh, doing like little, they call them human interactive tasks, I think, hits. Right. Um, and you get like credits from Amazon. And I got Starbucks vouchers and I sold the Starbucks vouchers for cash <laughs> by kind of vellum. <laughs> and then once I got vellum, I went on Fiverr and I was selling uh, formatting services for $5. So I kind of formatted hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of books um, in that time. Um, so yeah, I wasn't really, I didn't really get time to kind of write my own stuff in that like those 18 months but it got me to the point where I could kind of buy everything I needed like ISBN numbers and covers and stuff and also got me into being able to get a deposit to rent a house as well so um it kind of got me to the starting point where now I can kind of finally like yeah. <laughs> uh, get back to writing and not having clients so yeah wow okay uh, question number four is what mistakes do you think you've made and what have you got right uh I think in hindsight that was definitely a mistake but I didn't know any better at the time so if I was doing it again um, if I'd known then I would have applied for universal credit as a startup business right. uh, because that would have paid rent and would have got a house earlier and I would have been able to write quicker um, there's also like government funding for startup businesses so I could have applied for that and um, there's things like the Winston Churchill travel fellowship so um, that funds people to do writing as well like to travel and write uh, so yeah, there's kind of like in hindsight, I would have done, would have applied for funding straight off, and I would have got a business. I would have hired somebody straight away on the business side, so basically they can look after all the business and accounting stuff, and then that would just lead me to write each week. So yeah, yeah. that's what I would have done differently. <laughs> um, not really a mistake as such, but uh, I would have, it would have saved a lot of time. I wouldn't have kind of faffed around looking after clients, and I mean that was good, but um, I could have been writing my own stuff rather than ghostwriting for other people and watching those books do well and crying <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah uh is there anything that you've got uh right particularly uh yeah i think um i'm very very close to a lot of my readers so um 
I think that's definitely been something I've done kind of well um, and in, and kind of being very open and honest with the readers straight from the beginning and uh, kind of getting them involved in every bit of the process so they kind of know what goes into a book uh, which has been really good and the other thing was um, I started a, an annual day like a national day it's it's a worldwide day called cozy mystery day um, on Agatha Christie's birthday in September so that's been really good nice. uh, because if you start like your own day then you can kind of get media like you can get media coverage for free at the back yeah. of that so um that's been really good and it's also helped me to kind of connect with other authors and other readers and get the genre out because it's not a very well known genre in the uk um but that's definitely helped yeah yeah it's definitely um go back to your, your the youtube stuff it's definitely a very transparent way of writing yeah it's I, it's it's for a lot more vulnerable but then i kind of i think like cozy mystery genre especially it's kind of like they're, they're books that you go to when you're having a really bad day. So, right. um, and they kind of make you feel cozy. So it's quite nice. And I drink a lot of tea and uh, the cats kind of sit in the cardboard box next to me when I write. So um, it's kind of like, a, and especially at the moment being on lockdown as well, a lot of my readers are um, kind of at home writing or like really kind of struggling at the moment on, on lockdown wherever they are in the world. So they've been knitting and things as I write. So yeah, it's been quite nice. And then kind of like, chatting backwards and forwards as well so nice okay well question number five is what's your final piece of advice for authors starting out in indie publishing uh probably if you if you absolutely know like for me i i've i've always been a writer um i've always told myself stories to kind of cheer myself up so um and it's only recently that i've kind of realized that there was a lot of shame in that i think because of uh, perhaps early experiences as well um kind of had that creativity knocked out of me and was always very shame like even i haven't really told like i've got books in waterstones and things and i haven't even told friends about them so right. <laughs> still a lot of like a lot of people don't know what i do yeah, you should probably <laughs> do that day to day <laughs> <laughs> yeah might worry my also thoughts but <laughs> um yeah i think there's um i i, I think and it's it's kind of really impacted me because I, I like I love writing, but I always feel really guilty when I'm writing because I enjoy it so much, and I feel right. like I should be doing like a proper job, um, you know, kind of helping people or I don't know. Like I, I'm in books, help people, so it is an important thing to do. But uh, I think um, if if I'd have, I mean, I'm really lucky now because uh, obviously I've got like kind of the SBS community and Twenty Weeks community, and I've met really kind of people online through that and i can't wait to meet people at conferences in person um but if you can try and like like if you have a kind of mentor or like try and surround yourself with people kind of where you want to be then it kind of makes it more okay to be aspiring to that whereas i don't in my normal communities i don't know any writers and they all think i'm completely crazy for you know i should be doing should be out doing a proper job <laughs> to be fair, I, I think so, um... i think every every non-writer friend is is like that like my, yeah. my mind is, they don't know what I do. Yeah, <laughs> and they just think it's drinking tea. I mean, it is a lot of drinking tea, but yeah. <laughs> there's a lot of hard work. And uh, it isn't just like, you know, a kind of, I say writing in your pyjamas and like sitting at home watching Netflix, but um, like it kind of is, but it isn't. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot more kind of, uh, I think people don't really appreciate that it's actually a business as well. Yeah. So um, I've definitely felt a kind of self pressure, I guess, that um, I've always, I always feel really bad for writing because um, I don't know, it, I, I thought it was like a fear of success at first, but uh, I think it's a kind of, it's like, um, it is that being a closet creative person. And I think especially in the UK, we're not kind of brought up to be creative as much. So, yeah. um, you know, even kind of working in the film industry and things and meeting screenwriters and, you know, like people like making the productions of the things that I love and I like, get to talk to the authors on set. Um, and I'm like, wow, that's so cool. Like, to, like I didn't even know you could do that as a living. <laughs> so, um, and you're allowed to do that. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, jokes on everyone else now because we're in lockdown and we're all wearing pajamas. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so. Exactly. So. <laughs> it, it, you can be in pajamas and still be productive and have a proper job. Exactly. Well, I think everyone's kind of learning that now, and they're and they're learning it's not as easy working from home as they thought as well. So. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's quite good. It's like, welcome to my world. This is kind of how I've been for the last 18 months. So. Exactly. <laughs> now you know what it's really like. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you very much for coming on, sir. Those are your five questions. Oh, thank you very much for having me. That's it for this week's self-publishing spotlight. 
Don't forget that you can get your free self-publishing resource kit at selfpublishingformula.com forward slash starter kit. And if you want to appear as a guest on this show, send us brief details about yourself and your writing at selfpublishingformula.com forward slash spotlight dash guest. I'm Tom Ashford and I'll see you again next week. <laughs>